there. Now we can see each other. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you. Not happening. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know what it is. Try now. Talk now. Can't hear. Um, this is what we do sometime. I'm going to go back to and recents and call you. So I'm going to call you. I'm going to hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, so if I can hear your questions, I can do it on the phone. It's a workaround. Hello, Joe. Hi. No, I um I can't talk now. I've got um the VPR is, is trying to do an interview. We're trying to figure out how to use Zoom right at this moment. Can I call you back after like this tonight? Okay. Nice to hear your voice. Okay. All right. Bye bye. I do. Do you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, I hear you. Oh, good. Uh, sorry about that. No. Nah. All right. My son called me on the landline in between. I was saying, I thought it was you. Nope. Oh, uh, you pause it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Um, so, Emily, I'm just going to have us um, actually stop video and just have audio just because that's what we really needs to work um, so that it's not, that maybe, you know, uh, gives us more space in our internet connections. Yep, yep. That's fine. Okay. All right. Do uh, so you want me to stop on my end, too? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, select a stop video. All righty. Okay, great. Um, one more thing. Big H. Yeah. For hemp, happy, hopeful, helpful, hallelujah, yeah. honey. It's a good letter. Yeah. All right. I think uh, I'll start recording. Um, I think we are good to go. Good. All right. Um, so I will read a brief introduction and then we'll uh, get right to it. <clears throat> This is All Things Considered on BPR and Henry F. Vermont's primary election is fast approaching. Early voting has already begun for the August 11th primary. And so over the next several weeks, VPR will be featuring interviews with candidates running in contested primaries for certain statewide offices. Today, we'll hear from Emily Payton, who's running in the Republican primary for governor, facing four other candidates, including incumbent Governor Phil Scott. This is Payton's fifth run for governor in Vermont. She lives in Putney and runs a business focused on building material made out of hemp 
and Emily Payton joins me now. Welcome. Hi. Thank you, Henry. So first I want to ask uh, about sort of the moment that uh, Vermont is in right now. We're in the midst of two major crises, the public health crisis of the last few months uh, from COVID-19 and the economic fallout from the COVID-19 shutdown. So uh, given, why do you think Vermonters should turn to a new leader at this time? Well, um, the reason why I've stepped into the race and is to provide a mechanism to and a method to safely bring the power of self-governance to the people. Because when I was very young, when I was five, I, I had a, um, an experience where I was aware that I was going to be a political leader. And as I uh, grew up, I was just absolutely appalled and disgusted at the, uh, the lack of integrity that politicians uh, compose themselves with as a whole. And moving forward, it has just gotten worse. Uh, politicians have, have failed us. They've failed to bring the peace and prosperity. Uh, they failed to uphold our God-given unalienable rights, even through this COVID. They've failed to take care of the planet. Um, they've driven us to war. Um, and with the, the media part and parcel to that. So um, during the times that I ran, I was looking for a way uh, that we could empower the people. And like Bernie, I've had a lot of you know, very difficult failures uh, running, but uh, now I am prepared because I have the methods that we can restore the political power to people through dynamic governance. So uh, when I am elected governor, I will be convening neighborhood councils and people's assemblies uh, so that we can begin to utilize mechanisms like a people's exchange to do the most crucial thing, Henry, and that is to enact a just money supply. Okay. Um, well, as you mentioned, you've run a, a couple times before. This is your fifth time running for governor. Uh, you've run before in the Republican primary and as an independent and the Liberty Union candidate two years ago. Um, in all those races, the highest vote percentage that you've ever won was 6% in the Republican primary back in 2014. Um, I'm curious if you think this time will be different and, and why? Well, for one thing, um, I am uh, approaching this much more seriously. We're getting uh, donations. We have, uh, uh, I have a big team. Um, before I was uh, entering into the Republican race because I had always quote, considered myself to be a, a Democrat and a, um, a liberal, but I was seeing that Democrats were not enacting principles of peace. So I thought I, I ought to get to know the other side. And when you do that, you find out that there are excellent people uh, on both sides and everybody really wants to uplift humanity. It's just a matter of how. So um, I think uh, I want you to repeat the question right now because I think I'm uh, going afield. Well, so, yeah, I guess, why do, you, why do you think this time it would be different in terms of um, how much of the vote you might be able to garner? You've the highest- uh, Yeah, you yeah. well, I'm already, uh, um, I'm already getting donations. Um, I went into uh, running this time as uh, as a response to the COVID and the um, the the type of uh, compelling outcomes that I think that we need to go down a different path, a path that increases our humanity and doesn't uh, uh, destroy it the way uh, these protocols have. Um, so I want to bring forward things that the media has left out. That's why my campaign is called Truth Matters. I now have a growing team of volunteers. My, uh, I'm beginning to get significant donations. And uh, really, you know, because I'm so different than the status quo, um, I really need to make a uh, um, pretty meteoric, meteoric, is that the right word? I need to do a pretty quick rise because there's so many ways to, um, to stop a transformative leader. 
as we've seen with Ron Paul, we've seen with Bernie. Uh, you mentioned uh, COVID-19, and, and so let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, relative to other states, Vermont has seen fairly low rates of COVID-19 infections and deaths, uh, though still some. Uh, given that, what do you think of Governor Scott's response to the pandemic and his overall leadership in these last few months? Um, I've been very concerned, uh, terribly concerned. Um, the We have uh, 56 deaths. So, and I've also been concerned about the way the media has been um, stoking so much fear. So when we look at the areas that have had the most success with COVID, we learn the appropriate ways to deal with it. And the uh, Japan has had the best uh, outcome with COVID. Now they have not uh, done any of these protocols, not even mask wearing, not even shutting down uh, hairdressers and so forth. They've not done mass uh, testing and they're, as you know, a very large country. They're uh, 126 million and they've had under, under 1,000 deaths. I think part of the reason why they've had such a good outcome is that they haven't stoked the panic that we've seen here. They haven't made people afraid to care for one another. Um, and they have come out way far ahead as well as some of the other states here uh, who have come out ahead without decimating their small businesses. I think there's seven of them, and the most notable of which is South Dakota, which never uh, instituted any of these protocols, but left it up to personal responsibility. And we've got to remember um, that we have in unalienable rights. You know, you know what that means, Henry? Mm -hmm. That means that they can't be taken away. They're there. They're given to us by virtue of us being human and alive. And we we have to understand that these protocols that have kept us from hugging one another that have kept us from uh, standing near our loved ones as they die uh, the, the, that have uh, you know made us into prisoners into our own home that really may not have made us safer and i think when all is said and done we'll find out that not only have we been not safe we have decimated uh, the small businesses. So, you know, my friend wants to go get a bike. Now he has to go over to Walmart to get a bike. And it, it, it doesn't stand to reason why the small businesses were shuttered and the large businesses were allowed to stay open. So consequence of that is that we've seen the largest transfer of wealth to those who are already ruthless with it. Amazon, uh, what's his face, uh, Jeff Bezos, now is the world's first trillionaire. Now, these are what is known as disaster capitalism. So, um, if elect me and we will set ourselves on a different path and I will convene neighborhood councils and people's assemblies and an inquiry to find out what really we ought to do during these protocols and to decide together a way to restore our humanity and let not this new normal ever become normal. Well, I mean, so what specifically, I mean, in a, in a new term, the new gubernatorial term, it could be uh, the we could be facing, continue to face uh, the coronavirus here in Vermont. So what specifically would you do differently in terms of policy responses to that than the Scott administration? Well, the first thing that I would do, and the reason why I've been proposing these neighborhood councils, is I would ask legislators or community leaders to help our neighborhoods to become more cohesive and uh, able to help one another. This means that households of maybe 20 households uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, talk to one, one another through a phone tree. They will share a skill set chart. They will look in on one another. So as we uh, encourage and support the people of neighborhoods to feel comfortable and safe talking amongst one another, those become the basis of, of the ability to meet any kind of emergency, be it a climate emergency or be it this sort of emergency. 
Um, so that is the first step. Of course, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and here in twenty twenty, we have the benefit of a great deal of tw of hindsight with uh, uh, the pandemic or um, the uh, the protocols that have been uh, outrolled for COVID. Uh, also, you know, certainly, sorry, uh, I would like to add, it, it, it really baffles me why this um, governor has not put a hand-washing sta station on the corner of every street or every town and, and uh, porta-potties for people to use because what's happening is that people are using the woods in the most, uh, you know, terrible way and providing a, a lot of problem with sanitation. So, you know, little things like that are very important. I want to turn to another topic uh, that's been in the news in the last uh, month or two. Uh, there have been increasing calls for police reform here in Vermont uh, ever since the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis back in May. And there are many activists calling for decreasing police budgets and reallocating those funds to social services. Do you support that, that movement to defund the police? Well, I'll tell you, uh, violence against anybody, no matter whether it comes from soldiers against another people, a person against another person, or a policeman against a person, decreases our humanity and is wrong. Nonviolence is strong. It's the strongest way to go. We have many uh, excellent police who are nonviolent and who are really important to help de-escalate the type of frustration and the type of crises that are happening in households. That being said, where there is any uh, police officers, and sadly there are because they've been increasingly militarized, there are police officers who have a, a penchant for violence, who have a desire to dominate. And wherever those exist, we need to uh, get rid of them. Now, what we need to do also is to restore the idea and the function of the peace officer. And a peace officer is, is uh, someone who, as is their label describes, somebody who uh, increases peace. Um, we are going to need more people who help us behave peacefully. Now, they may not have to carry weapons. There are all kinds of ways. And again, as governor, I will convene a, a people's assembly, especially so that we may re-envision how we do uh, justice, and in particular that we're not doing it to profit anybody. Restorative justice can be expanded exponentially, and I think the people should be the people who decide that what we're budgeting and how we're budgeting it, because in the end, we shouldn't be serving somebody's profit by criminalizing people. Uh, but so it sounds like you would support then moving um, money and away from the traditional methods of policing uh, or as they stand right now. Well, what's really important uh, about uh, the, the, the idea that uh, we're working with the money system of the U.S. dollar uh, the U.S. dollar is uh, systematically serving uh, greed, and greed on this planet is our biggest danger. It is ruthless. It is violent. It is. It will. It's our biggest problem. So when we're talking about a legislature that's working with the U.S. dollar system, tax and revenue, uh, you know, debt and all that, to me, that looks like we're working in a sandbox, a, a very limited sandbox, and. What my leadership has always been about, what I began running in 2010 about, was about let's get out of the sandbox and let's go onto the beach and utilize some of these other methodologies of exchange that allows us to expand our money system, our means of exchange. And primarily there is uh, the People's Exchange and there's several other. So creating a, a monetary system, a system of doing business, that increases a virtuous economy and allows for the people to fulfill their self-directed purpose is the best way that we can support the police, the best way that we can support each other, because each other's happiness and self-fulfilled directive 
increases our own experience of happiness and our own experience of our humanity. And that's why my leadership is transformative. It's also the reason why I aim for the gubernatorial seat because it is only through the sanctioning of the executive chief that we may begin to transform our monetary, expand our monetary uh, capacity through not only the People's Exchange, of course, the public bank, and of course, uh, there are other mechanisms. I don't know why we haven't had the Vermont credit card yet. Uh, for example, I mean, the, this is what my leadership offers that is in totally different from any other candidate. But if you were elected governor, uh, you would be expected to set a state budget, make a budget proposal under the existing monetary system. So would you do that if you were elected governor? Oh, absolutely. But my, uh, my, uh, my, my guidance will be coming from the people. So as uh, upon election in November would be immediately when we began to organize the neighborhood councils and we would call together the young people, the people who have already been meeting in 350, the people who have already been meeting in Occupy and using this dynamic governance system, we will develop a, a clear idea of what the people need. We've had kind of a nod toward that in the past in the Shumlin administration, but we need to actually move forward. And using, well, see what the People's Exchange thing is about is that when we take all the exchanges we can do in Vermont and we, uh, you know, the, the services that we can do for each other, the things that we can buy from one another, the resources, and we give them a, uh, a barter to barter system similar to what the VBSR does. It's a private system. So then we uh, move it forward with the authority of the governor's seat then we will be able to have a much greater capacity for exchanges. So, for example, we can totally rethink how we are, um, how we are uh, helping people to behave in a way with a conduct that's conducive to being part of the society uh, instead of being locked up, for, especially for nonviolent people. So yes, of course, we will use the dollars that we have, but we can use them much, much more efficiently. And moreover, we ought to be using them for the things that the people say they need. Now, this is really important because we're supposed to have a government for, by, and of the people, but we also need it with the people and within the people. And that is what we will be doing. We will be sitting in circles when I am governor and we will be deciding what we need and what we need to fund. And that will be the basis of my budget. Remember, we have two budgets. We have the regular budget and we have the comprehensive annual report budget. I just thought I'd put that in there. Uh, yep, I wanna to turn to another topic. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected black Americans. That's true in Vermont. Uh, black or African-American Vermonters make up just under 2% of the state's population, but 11% of COVID-19 cases. And black people are also disproportionately imprisoned in the state. Uh, how would you address racial inequity in Vermont if you're elected? Through a just money system? Uh, you know, of course, because the, uh, the, the people of color, indigenous people, have been um, so uh, abused by a... Uh, and a monetary system that makes money so expensive for those who need it most and transfers value to those who are totally un unempathetic and who are absolutely ruthless. What we need to do is we need to empower uh, our people. They, the reason why people of color have had, so 11% of 56 deaths is what? It's five, six, seven people at any rate. Um, that's how many people have died from uh, COVID. It's because when, when people are depressed financially, as, as people of color are, uh, are, and there's an awful lot of, all kinds of people who are depressed financially in Vermont. We can talk about the need to untax in a minute, but they aren't uh, able to afford the kind of food that uh, people of means can afford. The, the uh, you know the the organic food the 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 food from the uh, the farmers markets that's more expensive and 
so we really need to uh, increase their mechanisms of being able to exchange, increase their uh, access to excellent food, to vitamins. Um, so that's super important. And so you do that by transforming the monetary system here in Vermont. Is that what you're by doing? yeah, I mean essentially we're expanding it. Where we have the U.S. dollar that is systematically takes value from the people, from the working people, from the people who have none, and sends it to those who are really ruthless with it. So getting out of the sandbox means that we develop a people's exchange. Of course, we implement the public bank, and the only reason we haven't is because we have lobbyists who tell our treasurer that our, our bond rating will go down, but that's absurd because our bond rating will stay up as long as we pay our bills. So the 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 public bank will allow us to use our tax money more efficiently and allow the legislature to direct it to the things that we want to have happen <clears throat> such as you know maybe we want to put solar panel on everybody's house or something you know whatever it is the policy of the bank will be uh, according to what the legislature uh, uh, tells it to and then the bank actually guarantees loans through our local credit unions and so forth so it isn't competing with the uh, few uh, banks we have left that are from okay. Vermont. I want to turn to another topic. You mentioned solar panels. A poll conducted by VPR and Vermont PBS earlier this year showed a split uh, over the state's response to climate change. 39% of respondents in that poll thought that state officials are doing enough to combat climate change. Another 39% uh, thought that they were not. Do you feel like the state is doing enough to tackle climate change right now? Well, we can't do everything we want to do until we direct the money that we want to do it with. So, you know, if if we if the people had the ability to fund the things that they really wanted to see happen, we would see uh, permacultural farming everywhere. We would see the soil being built with biochar everywhere. We would see these hempstone villages, which you can go to my website and see, which are uh, a plan to uh, increase our uh, knowledge of sustainability and decrease our use of nursing homes uh, in the future and and increase our education of sustainability. Uh, so w honoring our planet, its beauty, its all its gifts of abundance. Remember, a seed in nature, if it isn't messed up by Monsanto, will give you an abundance, a, a true abundance. And when we begin to uh, look at uh, economics with parity, and I'm, I might be going off too wonky here, but what we need to do is to make our, uh, our, our um, state the most clean, the most um, natural, the, the strongest sustainable state. We absolutely need to uh, look at Wi-Fi, and I'm really concerned that 5G has been rolling out while during this pandemic. This is a weaponized grade of, um, of uh, bandwidth, the 60, band, 60 gigahertz bandwidth. And the people may not be experimented on without their knowledge of what's going on. So absolutely, I will be calling together, and this will be not allowed to have uh, lawmakers or governmental people in it. These will be the people coming together, and we will present the concerns that many of us have about uh, a 5G, and this is important because it stands to harm the oxygen molecule. So there's so much that uh, we the people need to do, and we need to do make our, our place really as much of a Garden of Eden as we can and reduce our use of anything polluting. We need to have the money to support the farmers to move to a true organic or, or permacultural or to, to pay for the young people who are willing to farm in a permacultural way. Does that is that a complete answer or not, Henry? <laughs> Um, well, it, it certainly uh, answers part of it. I mean, it sounds uh, overall like you feel like the state could be doing a lot more. Is that right? To come back kind of but you, you see the state, the state, when you talk about the state, the, the government of the state is a for business, is a business for profit. We're talking about the people of the state. 
and so and you're and, running to be the governor of the state of Vermont. That's right. So what I'm asking about is the is what you would do as the leader of the state of Vermont. Well, as the leader, I would uh, implement these monetary systems that allows the people to take care of their 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 planet or their part of the planet that they're on with integrity. I want to ask you about a, a different issue. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, the, a VPR Vermont PBS poll showed that 40% of Vermonters would not be able to cover a surprise $1,000 expense. And our reporting has since shown that women and people of color have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, both in health, health outcomes and also economically. So as governor, what would you do to address economic and health inequalities in Vermont? The People's Exchange. Public Bank of Vermont, a Vermont credit card, uh, the common good payment system. People of color and women have always been oppressed economically. We haven't even got an equal rights amendment. So again, when we look at the core of our issues, it is unfettered greed and politics, politicians always uh, are, are enabling the the growth of unfettered greed so what my work is to do is to help us create an environment an economic environment that uh, disincludes greed and increases work that's for the good of all now we can do this outside of the u.s dollar system in a constitutional way. And I dare say that's the only way we're going to get it done. Uh, so uh, the, the ideas you're talking about, uh, Emily Payton, are uh, fairly uh, radical uh, to the left, I'd say, uh, on the political spectrum. No, they um, aren't. You're, well, you're running... No, they country. aren't. Ron Paul has had, has had the same ideas. These aren't radical. These are transformative. They are needed. That our times call for them. And I will not let you call me a radical. I'm a transformative leader who will help the power return to the hands of the people where it belongs. Well, I'm just curious, uh, why run in the Republican primary? What, what Republican principles do you identify with? Well, Ron Paul was uh, an absolutely peaceable candidate. Uh, if he and Kucinich had uh, topped the bell, our country would be in a, in a in a different place. Um, so there, as I mentioned to begin with, there are uh, peaceful conservatives because taxing the people is a, a manner of oppression. And the thing about politicians is, like I said, they're playing in the sandbox. They think the only way to fund government is through taxation. This isn't so. There are... How else would you fund government? Well, there are other ways, uh, not only if we implemented the People's Exchange, where we value the amount of work we can do within Vermont for one another, then we can take a portion of our budget because we all buy things in Vermont. We all buy wood for our fireplaces. We all buy eggs that can be uh, uh, laid in Vermont. So we can take a portion of our budget and even the budget that we pay our, our governmental people and assign it to the People's Exchange. So that's one way. There are, uh, you know, so many ways. You, you, you. We need to come together and discuss it at length. I mean, these interviews uh, are not lengthy discussions with all the people. They're short interviews to give us an idea of who can lead us in a direction that sh that really um, fulfills what we know in our hearts is possible. And well, I uh, just once more uh, uh, before I let you go, um, it, it sounds like you agree generally with the Republican principle uh, of, of being opposed to uh, bigger government and, and uh, taxation. Is, is that right? Look at uh, the, the labels, labels, uh, 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 Republican, Democrat, black, white, uh, labels like consumer, taxpayer, all these labels dehumanize us. You will find that I will call people people, and we are equal. I will not be using labels. Uh, you, the the divide and conquer that has gone on has gone on too long, and that is why 
uh, in Vermont, you are not empowered to run as an independent. You have to choose a side. And I think I already explained that I uh, became a, a, a Republican um, candidate because I had before thought of myself as a, a liberal um, person. But I have found that some of the conservative values, such as restoration, restoring our right to be free. I mean, a free people are not a surveilled people, Henry. So our, uh, we have uh, things that we share across both sides and the, 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 the capacity of the media to make us think that the other one is the enemy is truly criminal. Emily Payton is running for the Republican nomination for governor. Emily Payton, thanks for speaking with me. Hey, thank you, Henry. Best wishes. Thanks, you too. All right, I think we're all set. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you too.